Hello and welcome to the latest webinar in the Elemental Talks program. Our topic today, Lessons in the Bathroom, the link between well-being and washrooms in schools in our session sponsored by Geberit. We're there for the next 60 minutes. My name's Jim McClelland, founder and editor Sus Meme, home to both the magazine and the top 500 rankings. Joining me on the panel this afternoon are Dr. Zainab Dangana, Head of Sustainable Technology at Weights Group, Lena Lindman, Communications Manager Eric, the Children's Bowel and Bladder Charity, and Daniel Fairfield, Product Manager for Bathroom Systems, Geberit and Twyford. It is all live, as you will see. There's a Q&A to finish, so please pop your questions in the Ask a Questions box. You should find probably at the bottom of your screen. If you type them in there, you pose them, I'll ask them, they'll answer them. So a little bit about Elemental. This webinar formed program of talks hosted and produced by Elemental, elementalexpo.com. It is the online community for professionals focused on innovation and heat water, air and energy, as the name implies, the vital elements within the built environment now and in the future. You will find a full diary of events on the website, range of upcoming webinars. You can also view the back catalogue, whole host of hot topics, all available on demand. Great who's who list of speakers. And I should add, everything is free to access. Thus, next year, the physical, real world, in-person Elemental Expo will actually be taking place at the NEC in Birmingham, 21st to 23rd June 2022. So see you there in the flesh, as it were. Right, we've got plenty to cover today. So brief intro from me just at the start. Lessons in the bathroom, especially heightened awareness about the importance of hygiene in a post-pandemic world. The bathroom has become a focal point for building performance and standards, as well as associated spend on refurbishment and maintenance. The education sector is fast becoming the most important room in the school. Shown by the results of a YouGov poll conducted for session sponsor Gebrit, and I don't want to steal Dan's thunder, so I shan't give you any of the stats, but hygiene, privacy, and the condition of toilets are all key triggers of anxiety amongst children and concern amongst parents. However, in a snap poll of 100 schools, also undertaken by Gebrit, school bathrooms were not top of the list of planned refurbishments at all. So it's hard not to conclude that the problem is clearly known to us, but there's often no plan and frankly little desire to do much about it. So our webinar will explore the reasons for this disconnect, the lack of understanding about the link between washrooms and well-being, other issues around design, installation, maintenance, repair, or is it just failure to prioritise spend or sheer lack of budget? So our discussion will not only endeavour to answer these questions, but do so in the context of a framework for water sustainability. So let the debate begin. To start, I'd like to explore what lessons we can learn around the links between well-being and Washington schools. I'll begin by asking our panellists to introduce themselves, explain their individual perspectives, share some opening insights. So it's briefly kind of who are you, where do you fit into the puzzle, where do you think we are right now when it comes to washrooms and well-being. So first, to kick us off, from the point of view of a pioneer in sustainable tech and innovation, Zainab, where are we? Um, thank you, Jim. Um, I'm Dr. Zainab Dangana from Waste Group, and we are a leading privately owned construction development and property service company in the UK. And we work with a range of clients and partners across the public and private sector. Um, in my role, I lead and manage the weight sustainable technology services. And um, my aim is to connect providers of market ready sustainable technologies with building users and owners who are looking for these solutions. And we've got a marketplace of um, innovative uh, you know, suppliers that have been through a screening process. Um, in regard to well-being and the washrooms, we are seeing a need for products that could help improve health and well-being in the design, construction and maintenance of buildings. And especially for uh, projects, major refurbishments and even new build, uh, the uh, project team are looking into how they can achieve pre-arm well standards and they are credits specifically assigned for health and well-being. And we do have a range of products for washrooms on our waste innovation network, which focus on improving health and well-being and also saving water and carbon emissions. And our products range from simple retrofit products like a, a tap adapter by a company called um, Water Blade. We've got water saving toilets by Propeller, waterless urinals by Ecoprod and smart hand dryers and sanitizers by Servitex and our sensors by a company called MKL, and we have many more. 
And I'll probably be sort of, you know, saying a bit more about what those products do. And where I sit within uh, the puzzle is I play the role of a facilitator and a catalyst and help us with the transition to net zero and help support the uptake of these products, helping businesses uh, build back better and greener. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Zainab. So facilitator and catalyst connecting the tech solutions providers with those looking for those solutions, the clients, the customers, and good to hear um, a major refurb, you're, you're looking at those health and well-being credits and those kind of standards that support um, development of some of those innovations and bringing them to market. So, Alina, I wonder if you could give us your perspective. Describe for us the world of washrooms as seen through the eyes of the users, the children, especially those in need of the kind of support you offer. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity for us to bring the children's voice to this session. So just to introduce myself, my name is Alina, sorry, Alina Lindenden. I'm the communication, sorry, I, I'm getting a, I can hear myself as I speak, sorry. We can hear you fine. So you can hear, well, I'll just have to, to carry on, sorry. Yes, yeah, so I'm the communications manager for Eric, the children's bowel and blood charity. Sorry, I'm, I can't. I can't sort of speak naturally because of hearing myself. Um, what well, is there anything you can suggest that I do, Jim? Sorry. Um, uh, it's like a feedback. I, yeah, I don't know if um, maybe could I ask Dan and Zainab just to mute for a second, just in case in any way that's affecting. Does that make? Let me try now. That, and I can still hear myself, but I, I'm so sorry. It. Um, I don't quite know what to. <laughs> um, maybe try without headphones. Yeah, I think that's let's worth try that. trying. Just How's in that? case. Yeah. Oh, now we get a very loud noise. Sorry, that was clearly even worse. Okay, um, well, shall I? Um, shall we let Dan speak for a moment, and we'll see if um, we can message you in the background, Alina, and uh, see if we can suggest a couple of things. So uh, that'd be great. If thank we you. do a quick switcheroo then, Dan. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so not at all. We'll try and um, uh, hopefully we can try and do something about that. So, Dan, so if I was to come to you and say, you know, having surveyed the stakeholders, researched the schools, what is the view from your point in terms of European market leader in sanitary products? What, what are you seeing things at the moment? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, just firstly, I'd like to, to introduce myself. I'm Daniel Fairfield. I'm product manager at, at Gebrit, and as Jim pointed out, the European market leader for, for sanitary products. Um, my role really is as product manager is to manage the product portfolio from cradle to grave, mostly focused around our Twyford products, which is an additional brand that, that we own um, as a group. Um, and hi historically and currently, the education sector is, is such a key focus for us um, with regards to supporting them and, and having worked with them for, for quite a long time. Um, given that our core products are used within the educational space, um, it's so important for us to understand the people who use them and obviously the wider, wider issues that, that they're sort of uh, coming across um, with regards to using the products. Um, as, as you mentioned earlier as well, Jim, the, the YouGov survey that we undertook, um, we, it really came across that almost half of children um, suffer some kind of anxiety with regards to using educational washrooms. Um, I think this very much highlights a very real issue um, in schools. And, and there's a clear link there between, I guess, usage of the washroom, uh, well-being, and, and I guess as an indirect consequence, um, you know, academic attainment as well. Um, with regards to where we fit in, we're obviously a, a product provider and, and as an extension of that, the solution provider as well. Excellent, thanks. And good to hear education, a key focus. And um, I don't know if people have read in the synopsis some of those statistics uh, from the research you did, which um, were very interesting in ter terms of confirming some assumptions we might have had, but also challenging some in terms of a reality check where some of the numbers were definitely worse or not as um, as uh, comforting as we might have hoped. So, Alina, you are back with us now. Shall, I am. Shall That's we, so much better. <laughs> shall we go again then? Yeah. So, um, let's. Yeah, let, as I'm, if the previous yeah. hadn't happened. So, 
let's Alina. just forget all of, I'm so sorry I think uh, what yeah uh, let's no draw a line I Alina, can't hear sorry. myself yeah it was very disconcerting yeah. hearing myself in echo not not no. so let me echo. Be, thank so you let me begin again, again. So my name is Alina Linden. I'm the communications manager for ERIC, the children's bowel and bladder charity based here in the UK. We actually aren't really aware of any other charities around the world that do what ERIC do, um, which is surprising given it's such a big issue for children. In fact, um, one in 12 children will struggle at some point with a bladder or bowel condition. Um, and it's something that can have a huge impact, we know, on not just their well-being and health, but also the well-being of the whole family. So given the amount of time these children will, our children will spend in schools, we know that the environment for them in schools is a, has a key part to play in this. And I'm talking not just about children that might have a bladder or bowel condition, something like chronic constipation or a daytime bladder problem, or even those that might need to um, have a complex bladder or bowel, but all children. Because what we know is there is a very clear link between the way that the school toilets are not only designed and looked after, but children's access to them, and then um, the way that they feel about using those toilets. And in fact, at the very worst case scenario, we know of children that will um, avoid eating and drinking whilst they're at school as a way of avoiding actually using those school toilets, which it, it, it's, it shouldn't be happening. But sadly, from the calls that we get to our helpline and that's on social media, um, there was a, a debate on Twitter just a couple of days ago with a group of parents expressing exactly this issue. So it's, it's a big concern for a lot of families. Excellent, thank you. And uh, thanks for giving us that perspective, um, albeit second time around. Yeah, <laughs> got there in the end. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. and, so having having sort of set the scene and taking a few opening insights then in this this middle part of the debate before we go to the um, audience q a at the end um i'd like to zoom in on the specifics a bit and to be honest challenge our panel a little as to why we still have such a lot of work to do on the subject of washroom well-being why we're still effectively failing in school so i'm going to be asking What's the problem? Is it innovation, cost, culture, education policy, spend? What needs to change or just accelerate to make the kind of facilities we're talking about fit for the future? So you're first up in this, actually, Alina. So <laughs> as a charitable organisation, if I were to mm. challenge you and say, how can you? You are face to face with children mm. whose lives, as you just described, are made worse by poorly thought out, ill-equipped, mm. badly maintained washrooms. But how do you get designers and specifiers, decision makers, budget holders to actually listen and learn? Well, it might help to say what we tried to do um, back in about 2004, I think it was, we had a campaign, Eric's campaign was called the Bog Standard Campaign, mm. which we actually took to the UK government to try and um, have the same minimum standards for school toilets as the children's toilets as they do for the staff. That was unsuccessful. And I think actually it was before my time at Eric, but I think actually what happened is the legislation was even, it wasn't even as good as it had been before when they reviewed it. So it was a backward step. So we tried lobbying and that didn't work. So I think our focus effort now is to um, attend events like this to try and give children a voice um, and make sure that their, their concerns and what's actually happening to them is being heard. Um, also just encourage society in general to be able to talk more freely about we and poo because actually I think part of this um, is around the stigma around things that happen in the toilet it's a prior you know we would all rather be able to go go to the toilet within our own homes where we feel comfortable but unfortunately when you're at school that's not possible you are going to need to go to the toilet so it's about having making these open conversations and just like with mental health where people are much freer to talk about it now it's become more of an acceptable thing things around the toilet need to be made more acceptable as well, because it's only when you can have these conversations that you can begin to actually open it up and say, OK, so what needs to be improved and who can do that? Exactly. Good points and destigmatise some of it. And yeah. Can I ask then, obviously, I'm sure you have um, plenty of conversations with schools and education providers. Mm -hmm. How much do you talk to, in the nicest possible way, the kind of people that be in our audience, kind of people on our panel, to construction, to specifiers, to facilities management companies, to to the kind of companies who install, maintain, etc. The facilities involved. Do you have much? We don't. I mean, we no. I, I suppose in a, in a sense, it's frustrating because we would love to ha to have more sway, um, but that that isn't a close relationship that we've got. Mm -hmm. But 
but it would be great to, to look to do that in the future. I know there is a washroom company that have supported us, um, our Christmas appeal in recent years, which is brilliant that, that companies are recognizing that actually as a, as a charity, we, we, you know, we've got a huge amount of experience and knowledge, mm -hmm. but you know, there's only so much we can do really when it comes down to legislation, our hands are tied, but I think it's, we will keep plugging away at it. We, we released some best practice guidance working with another charity, Blad and Bell UK last year, which actually was recognized with the Nursing Times Award. So it's about us being able to promote things like that to, to sort of say at least take on board the best practice guidance um but yes you know it's it, we, we would love to have more conversations with others in the industry if that if that could help to to alleviate the problem great excellent good to hear that and hopefully others are listening to that message too mm -hmm. and so dan if similarly throwing down the gauntlet a bit in terms of influence and impact so many complex issues in play we're hearing design trends behavior shifts hygiene fears so how do you you know product manufacturers and suppliers, how, how can you be expected to make a real difference from where you are in that chain? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think um, design choices are so important when, when we consider some of the issues that we've already discussed here. Um, I think considering the needs of the people actually using them, um, maybe sometimes can get lost a little bit. I think, I think particularly with some of the design decisions, sometimes it can go come down to cost a little bit more than usability at times. Um, I think with this in mind, um, I think manufacturers in the industry certainly are well positioned to educate. Um, certainly, I think some of the some of the technical guidance that's out there as well, if we if we refer to some of the other areas, I mean, Alina was um, sort of alluding to some of the accessibility requirements um, within our building uh, regulations, we have part M, which is all around accessibility. Within there, um, some of the examples that there are design considerations for people with visual impairment, things like this. However, when we contrast and compare that to some of the school technical regulations like technical annex 2A, we don't have these design considerations. I think that this is this is an area where we can lobby and push and, and try to help. Certainly, I think from an from an actual product point of view, um, I think there are things that, that certainly can help um, with, with regards to the, the research that we've undertaken. Uh, definitely, I think uh, I think as as you alluded to earlier, Jim. I think some of the uh, um, certainly with with uh, some of the touchless devices i think when, when we commissioned some of the research i think one of the issues that we had was around uh, parents of children um seeing that uh, that they didn't really um that they experienced this anxiety due to having um touch points within the bathroom so in order to help with that we have some of the touchless products available for instance one of the other issues we had uh, as part of the research that came to fruition was around hygiene requirements and state of design um, as well in that in that capacity we we have things like uh, concealed systems um, so you can put the system behind the wall for instance so that's an extra thing that doesn't need to be cleaned it helps with clean design minimalistic design and and also things like rimless wcs whereby you, you know the they're easier to clean and they wash away contents of the toilet a lot easier. These technologies are already available. Um, and I think I think there is an educational piece there in order to try and get that message a little bit more widespread to really drill into the features and benefits and, and really understand what the benefit of using these kinds of products are. Excellent, thank you. Some nice points there. And could I just ask you a follow up then in terms of COVID and the pandemic, obviously hygiene, um has become a primary concern are you having different conversations or has it just intensified the kind of conversations you're already having about hygiene has has it changed the game or just heated it up for you i'd say given what everybody's been through in the last two years i think this very much is a topic at the forefront of a lot of conversations i think hygiene in general has become a lot more of a topic um certainly uh, in the last 12 months or so um i think moving through into into next year as well i think we're going to see that trend continue um i certainly think that the importance of selection of types of products within the washroom is going to become more and more intensified and, and certainly more and more important um particularly these conversations with some of the designers with contractors 
and really trying to educate them on, on best practice when it comes to uh, selecting how to design the washroom, but also the, the fixtures and fittings that go within there as well. Excellent, thank you. And uh, in this round of our more challenging questions then, so if I come to you, Zainab, now, so my, my, uh, my prompt for you is kind of, so water is an increasingly scarce and valuable resource. We know this and we see it in headlines regularly. But is sustainability thinking in the bathroom? Is it stuck just on efficiency and water saving? Is it not sufficiently focused on design and customer experience? Are we just seeing water as a resource and bathrooms not as an experience? What are your thoughts on that, please? Um, I sort of um, think that the um, the suppliers I am are working with are focusing on both. Uh, the efficiency and the savings as well as the design and experience and I would give some examples here so for example one of our innovation partners which is the propeller uh, smart toilets uh, they work on the principle of the aeroplane toilet so they use water air water to flush the toilet uh, with the lid closed and has got a latch so the product has been designed with a well-being point uh, with the latch which sits away from the pan and has got antimicrobial additives and also the toilet has been designed to flush with the lid closed and this reduces the spray of germs into the air and a normal toilet will emit up to 80 percent of airborne germs uh, even with the lid closed but with the propellant toilets this has been designed to eliminate up to 95 uh, percent now linking this with the survey results um, that um, Dan talked about which also mentions that one in five parents said that um, their kids had issues with um, the school toilets and one third had concerns about the standards of hygiene and almost half reported that the children had anxiety using the school uh, toilets again which was sort of picked up by Alina. So um, if I just you know, uh, focus here on the anxiety and how some of these products have been designed to reduce that. So the popular toilets again uh, have been designed with a transparent lead which is clean and children can be assured that they are touching a clean toilet and they can see the flush, uh, which could also be exciting uh, for the kids. And the toilet sort of, um, and the kids actually do get um, a guaranteed flush, uh, which leaves the bowl clean. And so there's no fear of leaving a dirty, you know, toilet behind or embarrassing themselves coming to a dirty one. So, uh, but I would also want to talk about anxiety from a different angle. And this is more from the sustainability angle. And we are seeing that the younger generation are more concerned about uh, a sustainable future and the impact that we are making with young leaders like Greta. And they're really worried about climate change and the impact it's going to have. And I think having technologies that can assure them that we're making a positive impact and um, saving our resources and reducing our global emissions could help. So I think having technologies that have got a visual impact could help. And I'll give another example there of a tap adapter in which the water comes out like a flow um, in the form of a thin blade. And that sort of gives that visual experience and maybe some assurance to them. And that could help um, elevate sort of their anxiety issues. Um, so, I mean, they, uh, there are quite a few other, you know, products out there. Um, from a hygiene point of view, we've also got um, a EcoProd sort of waterless urinals and um, they've got the self you know cleansing uh, mechanism and um, it works uh, using the footfall uh, data so I think from the technologies I have been uh, you know working with they are focusing both on the efficiencies as well as um, on the design and um, customer experience excellent and uh, maybe Dan if I could come back to you and uh, give you also the opportunity to talk a little bit about how you are responding to both those agendas in terms of water saving and efficiency, but also the design and customer experience. Maybe I'm sure in your product range, as you mentioned earlier, I think you are responding to those kind of hygiene concerns and making, if not attractive, then improving the design and the look so as to make it a more pleasant, a more desirable experience for users. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of water sustainability, I mean, uh, I'd, I'd say most of the products that I look after in, from a portfolio point of view are vessels for water in some fashion or another mm -hmm. that you know that they're designed to be used with water I'd say that there are many things that are, that's done in order to reduce the, the water use so if we think about uh, so some of the uh, the tap 
products that we have, you can can restrict the water flow down to a predetermined amount. And the WCs, uh, we, we have dual flushing mechanisms that, that can take you right down to, you know, um, 2.6 litre flushes, for instance, um, that really help with that, and um, that can comply with some of these schemes that, that Zion had mentioned earlier, such as BRIAM and, and things like this. Um, I mean, as well as that, I mean, I think in, in terms of the design, I think I think a really clean design can really help with the perception. I think perception is so important when we're talking about anxiety. I think your first impression of the washroom can, can mean so much. I think if you can have a really minimalistic, clean design, I mean, I was talking earlier about concealed systems and things like this, the more you can put, in my opinion, behind the wall, out of view, um, the cleaner you, you can have have in the washroom and um, it, it certainly gives you a better impact and a better first impression um, to whoever's using the, the washroom itself. I think the other thing that can certainly help um, is if we think back to the poll that we did, 14% um, um, of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the parents that we surveyed um, they mentioned that children's touch points were a source of concern and anxiety. Mm -hmm. With this in mind, touchless products um, by far, certainly in the last two years as well, uh, with what's going on in the world, um, we've noticed uptakes in things like um, touchless taps, touch, mm -hmm. touchless flushing actuators, um, and things like this as well, which can certainly help alleviate some of that concern also. Thank you. And just before I move on to the final, Alina, could I bring you in on that? Do um, if you if you're listening to the responses of children, do they talk about the individual elements, the toilet, the tap, the basin, or do they talk more about the whole washroom experience and not necessarily single out the the, the separate elements? Well, I think each child's experience is is different, but I would say if you think of it from the point the perspective of a child with an additional need, perhaps such as autism, there's there's a whole range of different things, mm -hmm. such as um, the hand dryers that will go on automatically. Um, and I, I agree with Daniel, your points about making it a lovely, uh, you know, nice clean space. But it's simple things, even just like having floor to ceiling um, doors. Because sadly, school toilets have always been a, a, an area of the school where bullying will happen because some children will use them as a place to go in and, and misbehave and actually not respect yeah. the environment. So and, and it, privacy is key for these children. So simple things like that can help. But I think it is around, you know, if an investment is made to make these toilets, to spend the money and to get them into really good shape, the onus then needs to be on the children to, to you know, we've, we've um, invested this money. So we they're being shown respect because they're being valued. But also I think it's around educating children that then they need to look after the facilities as well. Mm -hmm. And hopefully by by making the facilities nicer, that is the way that you you lead children to have, to understand why it's important to, to, you know, not do silly things like block the toilets up, which is what some kids do. <laughs> but in terms of their specific concerns, I think it's general anxiety around using the toilet away from home. And then the, the, the fear of the fact that even my own children, you know, they're, they're at a, 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 what you would call a nice school, but they've come home even since COVID saying there's no um, soap in the toilets, which I find incredible. But that is, you know, that is the reality. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. Thanks. And um, yeah, and so moving on, that, I mean, we've looked at some of the challenges and it definitely is an area of difficulty with issues and um, where um, we, more could be done for sure, as we as we spoke in various ways earlier. But now for this last set, part of the session, before I go to the audience Q&A, and I see there's some questions already in the box and I encourage others to uh, type in there. So I'd like to look kind of reasons to be cheerful and positive and hopes because of course, there are things we need to address, but there are people doing things about it and there are improvements being made and there is progress. So in the I've entitled this section positives and hopes, no less. So I want to look at how su successful and sustainable approaches to well-being in washrooms can really drive meaningful change in the industry, the education sector and society at large. So maybe if I'm, I'm asking you to look with your rose tinted specs on then Dan so let's fast forward five or ten years from where we are here having having understood the trends as they are at present five or ten years hence what will success be looking like for your industry yeah I, th I think through the discussion we've had today I think it's very clear what what we we 
we know the issues are. Um, and I think a lot of this, and I've alluded to it already, I think can be alleviated from, from, um, from, I guess, education. I mean, I mean, Alina was talking about um, potentially bullying happening in the washroom. Um, if you redesign the washroom, potentially, I mean, there, there have been studies that have shown that if you move the wash, the hand washing facilities outside of the, the washroom itself, this can reduce bullying in the washroom, for instance. It also gives you an area where where um, some of the teachers can oversee that and, and help them practice good hygiene as well. Um, I think I think success will ultimately be an area where all accessibility requirements are fulfilled. Um, and certainly anybody with any kind of additional needs and anybody who has an access requirement for a washroom can go and access exactly what they need. Um, I think from from the discussion and the things that we've shared in 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 this uh, in this session, the the technologies and the products and everything that we have available at the moment show that that we we're already in a place to do that. Um, and I think some of the points taken on board around collaboration with different entities within the industry and adjacent industries can certainly help push us to to that next level. Excellent, thank you. And um, let's hope so. And uh, Zaina, if I'm coming to you, so thinking your most positive thoughts, um, how could sustainable technology prove transformative for well-being in the washroom? And I might maybe add, if I could also ask you, is it about more innovation or is it actually just about scaling and rolling out some of the great stuff we already have on the market? So how could five or ten years on, thinking your most positive thoughts, how could sustainable technology be changing well-being in the washroom? Yeah, so what I'm already beginning to see is that there's a lot of artificial intelligence being incorporated into the de into the devices or the products. Mm -hmm. So they're not only doing sort of the basic function, but they've got additional functionality, like providing a dashboard, you can have advertisements, education awareness, and things like that. So, um, for example, um, I've mentioned about um, the waterless urinals. Uh, they have got a self-cleaning you know, capability and they are pre-programmed to clean depending upon the footfall. So all these things are sort of driven by data, the Internet of Things. Um, also, another provider that we've got on our waste innovation network is a sensor enabled hand dryer and it's also got a dashboard that not only says how many people have visited the toilet but how many what the energy you know savings have been so i think this is good about uh, raising awareness and educating the kids because i think this was sort of you know mentioned by dan and i think that is useful to know and then also um this you know particular uh, supplier and i'm sure others are beginning to you know uh, come up to they all have built-in you know sensor uh, technologies which can show real-time washroom usage usage analytics uh using some kind of you know cloud-based you know dashboard and they provide insights around how to you know manage the you know washrooms um the amount of you know times it needs to be cleaned so i think going forward i can see more and more of that and uh artificial intelligence and driven by the internet of things excellent thank you so and uh, yeah more tech-driven future and uh, as you say the data will obviously help inform design and um, uh, finesse the maintenance regimes and also flag up some of the issues potentially that anecdotally appear to be happening so before then we go to the audience q a lastly then alina i wonder if you could just look in this five ten years ahead how might the well-being friendly washroom of the future how might it actually change the conversation or help to change it around childhood continence how could it help i i think any advancements can only be for the for the good of children and it's incredible that our children are living in a very sophisticated world aren't they and i'm my mind is boggled by some of the things you've been talking about because they they sound amazing and the thought that they could be in you know all school toilets is fantastic but i think it's about getting the basics there as well and it is around having these it, making sure that if you invest in the toilets it shows children that you are valuing them and helping them to to know that they're respected and we know that for, in terms of these issues it can have a huge effect on children's ability to learn their well-being their morale and even their attendance levels so the more work that can be done on this and as i've said before the more conversations we have around this i i think the future is much more hopeful for children really Excellent. So, so, and that's a, as the section uh, invited you, that's a very positive <laughs> note there. So, thank you very much for that. So, 
this is where we're going to open um, matters up to our virtual floor with a live Q&A. So keep those questions coming. We've got a couple in. I've got at least one on Twitter as well. So you pose them. I'll ask them. Zainab Berlin and Dan will answer them. So if we take the first one in the uh, – or actually, it's the second one, but maybe Miranda's Barcolt. Uh, they're asking, is there any experience or examples of schools using data like number of flushes or toilet visits registered? Uh, and the like to analyze levels of problem and also use such analysis to measure effects of actions to ensure toilets are being used. So in terms of that kind of data, Dan, if I could come to you first, are you getting asked to try and help provide that kind of information increasingly? What's your, where, where are we at with that from your point? Okay, so, so there, there are products that, that are currently on the market and are being developed, um, usually in other commercial areas. So things like urinals that, that I know Zainab has, has mentioned um, is very, very much uh, applicable with, with this sort of question, uh, where, whereby they're, they're tracking the amount of uses, how often they're being used, how often should they then be automatically cleaned. We, we haven't seen this transition into schools. I think, I think the reasons for this are twofold. I think one is budgetary uh, constraints. Um, so obviously adding technology to things usually implies more cost and, and we usually find more cost is associated. The second reason is, um, I, I guess, uh, internet um, and, and the kind of uh, sophistication you probably need um, for, from, a, from a hardware point of view. Um, I, I don't know whether schools have access to, to the type of infrastructure that's needed in order to run something like this. Of course, when, when you get the data back, you then need to hold it in some format. Um, so you need some IT expertise potentially as well. So I think, I think these are the two two things that, that we're seeing as, as sort of roadblocks to, to this transition you know, to, to education. Excellent. And uh, Alina, if I could bring you in on that question. Are, are schools really using i mean it's, all, it's it's one thing collecting data it's another doing the analytics and using it to actually make decisions um, in a nice way are schools and those in the education sector are they using that kind of data to make decisions going forward or are we not there yet? uh i think i'm not really qualified to answer that from the school's um perspective but i from, I would guess from the conversations that we have with families of children that are going to school and their experiences, no, the schools aren't collecting that kind of data because they, unfortunately, what budget they have, I don't mm. think is necessarily, and that's borne out by the survey, isn't it? I think it it was the vast, the majority was saying they would spend it on outside space rather than the, the, mm -hmm. the, the washrooms. So I think perhaps we're quite a few steps away from maybe data like that being captured because again, it goes back to just getting the basics right. And then from there you can build. Um, Sadly, I think what we hear more about is children actually not being allowed to go to the toilet when they should be able to, right. restricting access. And that's to do with behaviour management, which really is the subject of a whole other whole other sure. discussion. But I don't think we're there yet. It's certainly in the UK in terms of that kind of monitoring. Although, yeah, I agree. it would it, Anything that can help is all for the good. But, um, yeah, I think we're a little way off. And Zainab, I wonder if I could um, extend that question in a way and ask, I know you have, uh, you work, closer with say clients in the banking sector who one assumes have bigger budgets and have quite um maybe even glamorous washroom facilities um i know it's a generalization but does a lot of it come down to budget are you seeing perhaps that the education sector just hasn't got the spend perhaps to be talking about some of the things you described in terms of the more advanced technology and data is it is it just not got the money to be playing on that pitch yet? Um, so I think most of the projects are driven by cost. Um, they um, probably like to do the minimum. Uh, where I've seen a requirement and I've put products mm -hmm. forward is when there's a requirement for Briam or Well, and then we say, look, these products could help in those areas. Uh, but from a point of view of hygiene and well-being, I haven't really seen that. And what I think the reason could be is because the developers or the contractors are not responsible for managing the buildings, but mm -hmm. maybe the FM providers would be. So uh, if a building is handed over to an FM provider, uh, they would be more interested in analytics like this because it's going to help them to manage it. So I think it's about the end user and at the early stage, uh, probably those that are constructing it are not really interested in that data coming through. Sure, and actually takes me kind of nicely to 
question in uh, via Twitter, which um, somebody says, isn't it just all about the M word maintenance, which I guess you could take in as facilities management as well. So Dan, in terms of design, obviously we've talked about sort of installing new, maybe, you know, start of the school term and making sure the facilities uh, look their very best. But obviously, I'm sure Alina, I'll come to in a moment, we'll talk about the fact that dilapidation, lack of maintenance and old and tired, maybe even broken and less hygienic systems. So the M word, maintenance, and, you know, looking at designs that last, especially in high traffic areas where the users may not always be as respectful of um, the, you know, the uh, facilities as they might be. So the M word, maintenance, what are we thinking about that, Dan? So, I mean, um, in in April 2020, there was a study by uh, TeacherTap, which is a daily teacher service uh, service, and that they asked 6,000 teachers about hygiene precautions in in school. And 37% of those respondents uh, reported they didn't even have soap for pupils, uh, which mm -hmm. is something Alina mentioned earlier. But the the other side of that is that they reported that they didn't have access to hot water either. Um, right. So, we, with regards to our own survey, we did our own snap survey of 100 schools um, undertook earlier this year that, that found that despite the very basic issues, school bathrooms weren't at the top of the list when regarding um, bathroom uh, re regarding refurbishments in schools. And it's been mentioned already that the external school grounds, were, which counted for 41 percent. Mm -hmm of these plan refurbishments and, and only 16% of schools um, were, were intending to refurbish their, their washrooms. I think this is uh, quite an important statistic to, to share and, yep, yep. and discuss around. I think when, when we're talking about maintenance, you know, if, if the, if the, if the um, fittings and fixtures within the washroom aren't being refurbished, aren't being repaired in, in, in a planned way, I think um, I think it really highlights quite quite an important and big problem. I'm sure. And uh, Alina, coming to you, I imagine um, some of the concerns and gripes are about poorly maintained or dilapidated or aging yeah. or damaged yeah. or whatever. All that all all the stuff exactly. that happens when they're not well maintained. Yeah, doors that don't lock, doors that are hanging off, broken systems. Um, and again, it goes back to why would a child feel like it was a place that they wanted to go to or look after if it if it's in that kind of poor state of repair. But I think the, one of the key issues, though, is if if the regulations don't say that a school has to have these minimum standards, then and when it comes to looking at budgets, they're not going to they're not going to spend the money, are they? The money's going to go elsewhere. And it, it's yeah, obviously, coming from the point of view of the charity that we work for, we see the sharp end of these children. Um, and what happens when they have this issue with the toilet. So it, I almost feel as if I'm sort of speaking as the converted, really. I think it's a case of persuading, not persuading, but making others realise just what an important issue this is. And, and without wanting to put you on the spot, you know, I mean, often we talk about, well, you know, customer demand drives markets. You know, well, we're hearing from Dan and yourself, the children, the parents, the customers, if you like, they are all expressing wants and needs. <laughs> you know and they are feeding back um so why is that not driving the demand in the sense that does the client be that the schools or the education do they need to express their dissatisfaction do we need to have some finger pointing you know i'm not saying a blame culture but mm. do they need to complain and shout and talk to the industry about you know these facilities and you know talk about budget do we need a more aggressive approach to getting this fix. Alina. Do you, do you want me to? <laughs> well, I'm, yes, I'm bound to say yes. Exactly. I think, yeah, I think as, as Eric has shown, we've tried taking it directly to government and it fell on deaf ears. So I think actually, um, as Zainab mentioned with the, you know, the, the example of Greta Thunberg and how she sort of mm -hmm. got a whole generation of children behind her, the children that, that are growing up now, are, you know, that they're very sophisticated in the way that they they talk about their human rights and i think that's all to be promoted really and let's hand it over to them and their families and and get them to sort of lead the way really because i can't see it really happening otherwise um I, what i would say is there's been a huge amount of pressure on schools particularly with covid sure, sure. um that you know in terms of you know their, their decisions around can they afford books and and that kind of thing but school toilets you know we wouldn't accept it in the workplace 
right, it wouldn't be accepted that you'd go in and have a dirty toilet that didn't lock. So why do we not treat children with the same respect? It, it does baffle me and it's very sad. But I haven't got any answers, I'm afraid. But no, I think, no, yeah. I, no, I, pre I appreciate and I appreciate your honesty about mm. it. And Dan, so in terms of the survey you did, you, you did, you know, take the temperature as it were, and you did get that feedback, and you did get the responses from uh, parents and schools around anxiety and that. And so, if I could ask you to just tell us a little bit more about what you've done with that information, who, who you would hope would see it, and who you would talk to in terms of changing. Uh, some of the attitudes because it's it's great to have the research and the survey done but then to be honest you know those are bullets and you've got to fire them so I wonder if you could tell me how you feel that might have helped you have conversations about doing things differently and um, making choices. Yeah I mean of, of course as as one of the leading uh, sanitary manufacturers in the industry we we, we, we uh, are part of some of the uh, larger sort of groups within the industry people like the BMA people people like um, things like this and also some of the technical committees that we also attend and um, these are very much the voices of the industry um, this 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 research really allows us to to take this and, and raise this in in these sorts of uh, the, these sorts of ways uh, to, to these sorts of people who do have influence who can lobby against this sort of thing I, I also think that there's a that there's a, a I guess a, I guess a, a a way that we could incorporate some kind of push-pull um, strategy with this. I know Alina was talking about the actual users of the washrooms. You know, if if we can engage them in some meaningful way with this information as well, give them a voice. And um, I think we're well positioned to do that. And at the same time, if we if we look back to some of the comments I made earlier about some of the technical. Um, some of the technical guidance that we have in the industry if we look at some some other commercial sectors like hospitals and accessibility environments it's very strictly controlled if we compare and contrast that with education and, and schools it's not anywhere near as strictly controlled um, and and i would argue that this this also needs to change good point and uh saying about now we sort of touched on this in a sense um Obviously, your brief is for sustainable technologies. Are we still at that stage where there's a green premium? You know, are, are they still, is it a myth that they're, that they're more expensive and therefore this is a luxury and exactly the kind of luxury that doesn't get used in school facilities? Or are we beyond that? Have we moved beyond the green premium now? Well, um, the green products definitely have a premium uh, of about 5 to 8% more. Uh, but I think what people are beginning to see is the bigger picture of what these products could do and the realization. So I think that is sort of helping because they're not only looking at the initial upfront cost, uh, but they're now sort of knowing that, okay, fine, if they invest in these toilets, for example, uh, the water saving ones, uh, they could save the equivalent of 3,000 pounds a year or depending upon the size of uh, the building. So I think people are beginning to see it in a bigger picture rather than just the initial upfront cost. Um, and I think people are now becoming sort of more conscious and there's been a lot of noise, especially since we had the net zero target uh, launched about two years ago, local authorities in the UK over 70% have declared a climate emergency, which is then uh, having an impact on all organizations. And I think just today I saw on the um, LinkedIn saying that NHS wants to be net zero. Uh, so probably there would be soon a similar target from the education sector as well. And when we talk about the net zero, they talk about the different angles and health and well-being sort of, you know, sits under that um, in the form of, you know, different ways. Um, so that's in regard to that. But um, I also just wanted to uh, answer one of the questions that came up in how you can uh, encourage uh, children to go to the toilets. And this is just of me thinking with my head uh, sort of hat on in, you know, 10 years time. Um, we probably need to in incentivize them. And uh, the kids are very, you know, techy, probably having products uh, that they'll be excited to use when they go there, probably, you know, pressing mm -hmm. a you know, button that could, you know, give them some, you know, kind of incentive. Um, and maybe to begin with uh, where we are now is maybe putting like a sweet sort of, um, you know, little thing on the wall. So after they've used it, they can press the button and get a sweet for themselves. So maybe sort of initially incentivizing them, you know, but eventually sort of using technology to, you know, do that. But then hearing what Elena has said with the schools really want to invest 
in uh, techie things like that, which is definitely going to have a much higher cost than even general sustainable products, because it's just not about the product here or the sustainability, but it's about bringing education and incentivizing them, which probably will have a higher cost. Uh, but yeah, um, th that was just my you know thoughts about sure. that question in the chat. Well, that opens up nicely that question. Before I come to Dan, maybe about the green premium as well. So Alina, you, you maybe saw that question. That's what can be done to ensure children decide to use, ensure or uh, encourage children to use toilets. So nudging elements like that. I wonder if you could just share some ideas um, about what can be done and and whether you have any questions or suggestions for the industry and how they can help with the nudge factor. Nudge factor. I think it's about making, getting children to sort of feel invested that they have a bit of a say. Um, after all, they're their toilets that they're going to use. They're going to know the different, um, you know, some of the things that I've quoted here will have come directly from what children tell us or their families tell us has been the problem. So I think it's about listening to children and asking them what would make a difference. I know there's, um, Dan mentioned about the the issues around having the, the, wash, the wash basins out separately. Um, and I know that, so, so I think when you start talking to children about it, you get all sorts of interesting insights, whether it's better to go in and you've got open cubicles and there's some, toilet schools that have had recent refits have had quite differently designed toilets where they're sort of almost in the middle of a corridor with almost mm -hmm. like opaque glass. Um, at the time, at the beginning, I saw a lot, quite a lot of news articles with parents sort of up in arms saying this is outrageous, where's the privacy? That seems to quieten down and I don't know whether maybe young people have got used to having the toilets designed in that way because actually usually it's been designed that way to stop the misbehaviour that I was mentioning mm -hmm. and kids have got used to it. I, I don't know, but so I think it would be really useful, interesting to ask the children themselves what sort of developments they, they think would make a difference. But um, again, I'll say just having the basics and getting children to care about them and maybe even things like getting them to design posters. We're about to launch a schools campaign just to educate, starting with really little children about good bladder and bowel health and not holding on to your wheel poo. And part of that is going to be them designing a poster. And we also want to have a poster for the teachers as well. Kind of we're all in this together you know we all go to the toilet <laughs> um the teacher's yeah. toilets are probably going to be quite a lot nicer and just trying to to get everybody to see it from everybody else's point of view so um engaging with children i think and they come up with some amazing ideas that that's what i would suggest the people the users themselves <laughs> perfect well that's nice that brings me around then dan a few final words from you if i pick up both those questions the first one really about the idea of green premium um is it a myth that some of the better designs you talked about are necessarily going to cost a bit more. I could also ask you to come up perhaps on the idea that is that just water's a little bit slow to come up the agenda in terms of what we're prepared to spend on. We under, understand energy and carbon a lot more now. That's been debated for longer. There's now more budget, more spend, more um, informed procurement. Is water just a little bit further behind the blocks there in terms of getting that kind? So first question, the green premium and um, are, are people going, do they have to spend more and are they going to spend more if water becomes more centre stage? I, th I think with regards to a premium for sustainable products, I think it really much depends on exactly what products we're looking at. Um, so if, if we're looking at WCs and systems, for instance, you can get dual flushing um, low, low literage uh, WCs that, that won't cost more than, than higher flushing equivalents, for instance. You can get bathtubs with, with lower capacity. Um, whereby we, we we drill the overflow a little bit lower down again and uh, not not more expensive um <clears throat> so i think it really depends on the type of products we're looking at there um but but there, there are many sort of sustainable solutions out there um i really think it depends as i say on on exactly what what we're talking about and what we're looking at sure. um uh, what, what was your second question? Uh, as, as a resource, is water kind of coming out of the shadow of energy if you like and they're getting a little bit more of the limelight and potentially they're more of the spend. I, I really get the feeling um, f from a government point of view that, that water is not not really seen to be much of an issue. Mm -hmm. I, I'd say, I, I, I think I see and hear a lot more around energy and carbon emissions yeah, yeah. And, and these sorts of topics, um, particularly very recently around carbon emissions, of course, but, but water maybe not so much. Um, I know from, from some of our interactions with some of the water authorities that, that there are instances where parts of the country 
do, do struggle to have access to water in general. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's definitely an issue. Um, but I, I, I don't see it as, as really being pushed in the same way that some of these other sort of sustainability nope. topics are being pushed. I, I agree. In some cases, it's either there isn't a cost differential or it's just kind of too cheap and it's taken for granted. I think we're still, unfortunately, at that stage, despite the scarcity and the stress and the occasional hosepipe ban and things like that. It's still not really mainstreaming. So then the, just the last word picking up both those things, especially from Alina, the nudge factor. Um, it's very interesting survey and research material you shared, Dan, and uh, uh, Gabriel commissioned and uh, undertook. Um, are you inspired to do more of the same? Are you inspired to engage more with the users, perhaps as Alina described, and generate more of that data and increasingly um, include those kind of sense? In other words, are, are you keen to do more of the same and get, and get a more informed and better suited uh, response from the industry as you move forward? Yeah, I, I think this this uh, survey and the, and the research commission should be probably the, the tip of the iceberg, as, as, as we say. I mean, Alina mentioned interacting directly with users and as well children uh, in particular, um, which would be really interesting. I, th I think getting their perspective as users is, is very, very important with this. I certainly think that there's a lot more we can do um, with regards to understanding a bit more how things are used, exactly what the state of play is. Um, clearly on this call, we don't have a representation from an educational body. So get, getting their opinion, I think is quite important as well. Um, and I think communication and collaboration, as I mentioned earlier, across diff different parties and entities is, is gonna be so important with this. But absolutely, I think this is something we wanna take further. Excellent, good to hear and nice. Communication, collaboration, nice notes to end on then. So in closing, so very big thank you to our panelists, Zena, Valina, and of course, Dan and our, our sponsors at Geberit. Um, to yourselves out there in the audience, uh, both for your comments in the chat and questions, a reminder to check out elementalelementalexpo.com. As I said at the top of the show, the online community for professionals focused on innovation in heat, water, air, and energy, the vital elements within the built environment now and in the future. Full diary of events on the website, upcoming webinars, back catalogue, all available to watch on demand. This session will be available to share with anybody who missed it, or if you missed the first 20 minutes, for example, you can you can rewind and watch again. So it's all freely available straight away after we close today. So big thank you again to my three panelists. That's it for today. I've been Jim McClelland, editor at Susmoon. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you all.